Well, good morning. My name is Pastor John, and I am the senior pastor here at Families of Faith Church. I was uh, born in 1982 on the south side of Chicago, and I went to a Catholic grammar school, so I grew up a Catholic, um, altar boy, so I was a real, real Catholic. And when I graduated grammar school, went to an all-boys Catholic high school, uh, St. Rita, south side of Chicago. And upon graduating, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. And I didn't want to go to college and waste money or time or resources, energy, learning things, doing things that I wasn't going to use in life. So... Um, Thank God my uncle got me a job as a union laborer. So right out of high school, I'm making union wages, okay? So I'm 18, 19 years old, making like $1,000 a week. And just like any responsible teenager, what I did was I blew it all. Because <laughs> um, I was still very worldly, so I spent most of my money on um, you know, jewelry and clothes and cars, like I had this really cool car. Um, it was a 2002 Dodge Intrepid, you know, all black, tinted windows. But I had uh, spinning wheels on there, like chrome wheels that still spun even though you were stopped. And because that was a thing back in the early 2000s. And, uh, you know, big speakers in the trunk and TV in the dash and you know, PlayStation in there. And spent all my money on parties and drugs and alcohol, just searching for something to fill that emptiness, right? But no matter what I did, I was never full, but I really didn't know then, so I just continued to do more of it. And because I had the money in the car and the clothes and the jewelry and the alcohol, I had the friends. And so I was the center of the uh, of attention. I was the party guy, and, and that was my... Um, late teens, early 20s, and it was right around I was 23 years old that I was like, you know what, I need to, I need to grow up. Um, I, I, need to, I need to do something with my life. This construction job, I would get laid off from time to time, and so I was like, I can't really build a life on this. I'm getting laid off, and I'm not really making the money that I need to make in order to have a life. And so I would always wanted to be a police officer. And um, I said, I want to be a police officer. I wanted to be a state trooper. And so I had researched what it took to be an Illinois state trooper. And I learned that you needed a bachelor's degree. So I enrolled in some college courses and uh, obtained a bachelor's degree online. So while I'm doing this construction job, working from 6 a.m. to 2.30 p.m., then I would come home and I would get on the Internet and I would have to read all these books and do these papers. And so for two years straight... Um, I did that, and I got my bachelor's degree, and then I began testing with a bunch of different police departments because I found out that there were some other suburban police departments that paid a little bit more than the state did, so I was like, hey, that seems like a route to take. So I tested with um, all these different police departments, and uh, 12 in total before I was hired by the village of Schaumburg was hired as a Schaumburg police officer. So went to, um, went to uh, boot camp and um, you know, got out of that and was a, a regular uniform patrol officer okay, in a squad car, writing tickets, doing all that stuff. And because I was a junior officer, I was on the midnight shift. That's where all the new guys went, to the midnight shift. So I was working 11, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. And what was big during that time was DUI. So I got a lot of DUI um, arrests. And so I was a top producer as far as the whole police department went because I, I was a worker. I was an achiever. I wanted to do police work. So I'm getting all these DUI arrests. Now, you take um, the amount of money I was making out of high school and everything that came with that, and now you multiply it by two. Um, I was making more money. I had more friends, more. I had my own house. I had uh, my own vehicle, a motorcycle. And, and, and along with the police thing came what I didn't have as a construction worker, and that was power, authority, respect, 
fear from people. Uh, people who knew I was a police officer wanted to be my friend. And so when I went to a bar or a club, I didn't have to wait in line. Um, I could go through the back door and I didn't have to pay for drinks because everyone knew who I was and they wanted to be my friend. And, and I was loving it. And so everything that this world has to offer, money, Parties, women, cars, clothes, jewelry, respect, power, everything it says. This is what you need in order to be fulfilled. This is what you need in order to have joy and peace. I had it. I had it. And I was a really good police officer. I was so good that within five years I was promoted to special investigator. Now what a special investigator is, is um, undercover. So there's this unit within the police department of four. And I was one of the four. And I shouldn't have been, because there's this unwritten rule that no officer within that five year period should be promoted to anything. But because I was really good at what I was doing, really good at police work, really good at communicating, and I was from the south side of Chicago, so I kind of had that street smart thing that these suburban cops didn't have. So within that period, now I'm, I'm undercover. Now when I talk about undercover, it's everything you see on TV, okay? Plain clothes, buying drugs with marked money, wearing wires, doing surveillance, search warrants, knocking down doors, police, get on the ground, all of that stuff. Um, I was doing that. Now you take what I had as a teenager, multiply that as a uniformed police officer, now you multiply that by infinity because in the police world, undercover, plain clothes, that's as cool as it gets. That's, 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 that's peak. Okay. So my, <laughs> my arrogance, my pride, my ego, my, my head, my greed, my sin, I didn't know it at that time, but looking back is repulsive but I was so full of myself, but I was never full in myself. I was so full of myself, but in everything that I have, I was never full in myself. I still wanted more. I needed more money. I needed another girlfriend. I wanted a newer car. I wanted a bigger house. I needed some more parties. I needed some more friends. I needed more acknowledgement. I needed to be lifted up a little bit higher and put on my pedestal. I needed more, even though I had everything, I still needed more. And God gave me more. On January 16th, 2013, I was arrested as an undercover police officer, arrested by the DEA, the FBI, several other police agencies within that area. Myself and my two partners, remember unit of four, myself and my two partners arrested and uh, we were accused of stealing narcotics from drug dealers and then using informants or snitches to sell that product back on the street and make money. That's what we were alleged of doing. And so um, you take a person who is on top of the world, who has the world, literally. And now I'm in an eight by 10 jail cell. Solitary confinement, because I couldn't be with the other prisoners because they would kill me. I'm a police officer, remember? Pride, respect, money, authority, all of this stuff, broken. Taken, taken right out from under my feet, lost my job, my pension, my benefits, uh, bank account, um, seized, house in foreclosure. My car seized, friends gone, name all over the internet, all over the newspapers, all over everywhere, even in other states, it was a big deal. I go from being up here to being down here in an eight by 10 jail cell by myself. Now I was in there a total of 21 days. Now, my bond was set at $750,000, full cash, three quarters of a million dollars it would take to get me out. In there a total of 21 days, and I didn't get out, meaning they fed me through a slot in the door. 
If I wanted to make a phone call, they would wheel a phone to my door. Within 21 days, I took two showers. So just to give you an idea, I'm locked in an 8x10 jail cell. 21 days. No one came and preached the gospel to me, didn't have no chaplain stop by, didn't have no books, no Bible, no movies, no music, didn't hear the gospel, didn't hear anything of God, didn't know anything. No one came to like witness to me. It was just me in a jail cell by myself. 21 days. 17th day that I'm in there is the night before my bond hearing. Now, a bond hearing is we're going to go before the judge and we're going to argue. We're going to say, judge, based on the crimes that he's accused of committing, this bond is ridiculously too high. You have to lower it. Okay, that's what's happening the next morning. 17 days, 18 days bond hearing. I remember this like it was yesterday. January 31st, 2013. I'm sitting in my jail cell on my bed. And it's like God pulled back the curtains and, and, and revealed to me what was really going on. In, 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 it was in that moment that I knew that, he, that everything that's going on in your life right now, this really isn't it. There's more to it than this. And I began to see my life and everything that I was doing and who I become. And I had this distaste and this disgust of, of who I became. And I didn't like it. And I just said these words, God, I need help. I, 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 I don't like what I'm doing. I don't like the way I'm living. I need help. I don't want to live this way anymore. I, I, I want to live for you. That's what I said. Not in, not in response to the gospel, not in response to preaching. It was just me and God in the jail cell. And I said, God, I need help. And it was in that moment that I physically felt this presence come over me. It was like warm syrup being poured over my head. It started at my head and it went down to my feet. It was warm. And I physically felt it. Now keep in mind, I'm not, this is not like an out-of-body experience. I wasn't in my jail cell too long and so I started hallucinating because while I'm feeling this presence, I'm thinking to myself, what is this? Very aware of what's going on. What is this? What am I feeling right now? Right? I'm Catholic. Well, they don't teach this stuff. So... I have no idea what's going on. And it's the first time I heard God speak. It wasn't audible, right? but it was very clear. He says, this is the Holy Spirit. Everything's going to be okay. No, 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 no. Everything's not okay. Okay? Can you see where I'm at? Do you know what I've done? Do you know what I'm facing? Everything's okay? I'm saying this. I'm thinking this. Now, I'm somewhat of an, of an emotional guy, meaning if things are going wrong in my life, if, if things aren't in place, if I don't, if something's just disrupting my life, right, I could lose sleep. I could not eat just like a regular person. You're going through some stuff. It's like, hey, loss of appetite, loss of sleep. I'm tired. I'm awake. You know, so mind you, everything that happened in this jail cell world completely destroyed, about to find out if I can get out. Now, if my bond isn't reduced, I have to stay in jail until this whole thing is over. That's what I'm facing. Either this judge is going to reduce my bond or I'm staying in this jail cell until this whole thing is over, which really lasted five years. And I'm at peace. And I lay down and I go to sleep, which it was so weird as if, as if God put me to bed like I was a baby. I was sitting on my jail cell in, in my bed and I just laid down and went to sleep as though a father would come in and just lay their child back to sleep. I went to sleep, which I'm an emotional guy. I shouldn't do that. And I woke up and I ate breakfast, which again, I'm like, how, how am I doing this? 
how am I doing this? How is this happening? Now, keep in mind, I, I'm still very aware of that whole, like, blanket, warm, syrup speaking thing. So I get out of my jail cell. We're walking to court to find out if Bond's going to be reduced. And I, like, I feel a presence with me, which is weird because it's just weird. In my mind, I'm like, what is this? This is different. Right? I feel, I feel something with me. I've never felt this before. I don't know what's going on. No one told me or taught me. But I feel these feelings and I'm thinking these things. But at the same time, I'm like, this is, this is still weird. I don't understand what's going on. So my bond gets reduced. Obviously, I'm out. Um, from $750,000 to $25,000, which my, my lawyer said, this is the most I've ever seen bond reduced in my whole life. And so that's on the 18th day. Now I'm still in there for a couple more days. Okay, so I get out and um, I'm on house arrest, ankle bracelet, and uh, one of my friends from the police department, you know, comes to my parents' house because that's where I was, that's where I was locked down at. Um, he came and he gave me a Bible. He says, hey man, you're going through some stuff, you're going to need God. And I'm like, dude, you won't believe what happened. Like, I think I already, I, I think I have him. <laughs> but it, 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 I never read the Bible ever, okay? But something was like, get in here. And so from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to sleep, from cover to cover, I'm in this Bible. And I'm starting to read what happened to me. And I get to Psalm 40. Psalm 40 was like the very first uh, thing that spoke to me. I waited patiently for the Lord, and He inclined, and He turned His ear to me, and He lifted me up of the miry clay, and He set my feet on a firm foundation, and He put a new song in my mouth. Many will see and fear the Lord. And I'm like, that's what happened to me. Like, like I, I cried out to God, and He heard me, and He lifted me up, and He, I got, I, I, and then I read like Second Corinthians, the old is gone, and the new is coming. I'm like, I think I'm born again. Like, I think what happened to me in that jail cell is what I'm reading in this word. I think the old me is dead and the new me. I think the Holy Spirit is in me and I have this relationship. So I'm reading this stuff. It's as if God's teaching me this stuff. It was so real. It, it, it was so real. God begins to speak to me and things were completely different things that I used to love I now despise and think things that I had no desire for I now wanted and so I'm in the word I'm watching sermons all day and it's just like weird but real but just because I got saved doesn't remove me from the penalty and consequences that I was facing for these crimes that I was rightfully charged with so you got saved, you got a new life, you got the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven, cool. You're still facing 20 plus years in prison. 20 plus years in prison is the amount of time that I was facing because of these crimes. October 2013, my lawyer says, John, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? You're facing 20 years minimum. They're offering you 15. What do you want to do? Do you want to take a deal? Do you want me to argue for a deal? Or do you want to fight this to the end? Do you want to fight this to the end? Now, at that time, I had gotten to know God well. Okay, It's been eight months, and I'm just eating up this word, and God's speaking to me. So I'm like, yo, if I'm going to go, you're going to go with me. I come to the point of saying, I, I'm not using you to get out of this. I fully accept my responsibility and role in this. If I'm going, then I'm going to do prison ministry. You're going with me. But what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? I'm not doing anything until you tell me. What do you want me to do, God? Do you want me to go? I, I need to hear from you. I need to hear from you. And this was October 2013. Now, there was this song that was on the radio as Mandisa's Overcomer. And it was new, so they had outplayed it. And I didn't like it because they played it every single hour. 
So it was one Sunday morning in October 2013, I wake up to go to church, and I turn on the radio, boop, and the very first words to come out of the radio, stay in the fight till the final round, you're not going under, God is holding you right now. That's a line in the Mandisa song, but it didn't mean anything to me because they always play the song. So I'm like, oh yeah, whatever, Mandisa, of course. I go to church. After service, I sit down in an office to send out some emails. And I'm like, I want to listen to K-Love. So I click K-Love, and the very first words to come out of the radio, stay in the fight till the final round. You're not going under. God is holding you right now. Now I'm like, hey. It's interesting. I mean, I know they play this song, but the very first word... I, I did that twice. I turned on the radio twice, and that was a, that's interesting. But I, I just missed it. I was like, ah, oh, you know, whatever. It was just cool. What a coincidence. That same night, I'm on my couch at home, and I have this conversation with myself. It's like, man, it'd be cool, you know, if I went upstairs and I turned on the radio and I heard that song. Yeah, that's not going to happen. No, but it would be cool. It would be cool, but it's not going to happen. You know, the possibility of hearing it three times. Yeah, but God, you know, and so this goes on for like 10 minutes. I have this conversation with myself. And then I go upstairs and I'm like, you know what? Let's see, whatever. Boop, stay in the fight till the final round. You're not going under. God is holding you right now. I immediately, uncontrollably start weeping because God spoke to me. That's God's promise. God, what do you want me to do? You want me to take this deal? You want me to go to trial? Stay in the fight. Go to trial. You're not going under. You're not going to prison. I got you. Okay, but, I, but, but um, that doesn't really line up. It doesn't make sense, God, because I, I am going. I, it doesn't make sense. But God spoke. That's God's promise. He promised me. That's the word that I held you know, till, this, till the end. February 2014, my bank account gets unfrozen. And it's the same day. Every day I get a Bible verse sent to my phone. Follow me now. And so that day, Malachi 3.10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse and test me in this and see if I don't open the windows of heaven and pour down a blessing on you so much so that you can't contain it. Same day, my bank account gets unfrozen. So I'm standing there with this bank account check in this verse. And I'm like, God, you want me to tithe this? I need this. I don't have a job. I don't have anything to live on. There's people I owe, lawyer fees, bills. I, I can't give you this tithe. This is... 20 grand. You want me to give you two grand? But I trust you. I trust you. This is what you're calling me to do? Now I realize nothing, there's no such thing as a coincidence. No such thing as I get this verse on this day. I know what you want me to do. And though my feelings and my intellect say no, my faith says yes, because we walk by faith, not by sight. And let me just tell you, when it comes to tithing, if, if you're not tithing, if you're not giving God the first fruits, right? You make $100 a week, that $10 comes straight to Him. You're missing out on an opportunity to worship God, to, to grow in your trust, to increase your faith, to further the kingdom. So I tithe this check and I pay off everyone, and I have no money. And my lawyer says, hey, you want to go to trial? I need 17 grand. I'm like, dang, dude. I already gave you 10. I don't have any money. In my mind, I'm like, what? I'm okay. I go out to my car, and my prayer was very simple. God, I believe you said go to trial. In order to go to trial, I need $17,000. According to your character, who you are, your word, you, you kind of have to provide this. Right, Jehovah Jireh, you're the provider. 
I need you to provide for this. I need you to provide this in order to do this. That was my prayer. I didn't send up no, 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 no GoFundMe, no email, no text threads, no phone calls, no nothing. I didn't want any human involvement in this money. If, if, if this 17 grand, if this word was from God, then this $17,000 had to come from him. I don't want no human involvement. So I only told God, no one knew this. No one knew how much I needed. It was just me and him. And my lawyer gave me a deadline, end of February. Now, I'm expecting, you know, to be in my bedroom and just $100 bills start rating. I mean, I knew God. I was like, hey, you, no, you could do this, right? I was going to win the lottery or something, so I bought a couple of scratch. I'm like, this is it right here. God's going to give me a scratch off, 17 grand. I'm checking the mail, which I never check my mail, but I'm opening, hey, random check. Here, like, you hear these, God could do anything. And my deadline got closer. My deadline got closer. And nothing was happening. Nothing was happening. And I remember these agonizing prayers of God, if you don't come through, I'm going to die. If, if, if you don't provide, then I didn't hear you correctly. You're not going to deliver me from this. I am going to go to prison. And if I am going to go to prison, then, then I have to come to the ultimate conclusion that you are not God. And you're not really. You never spoke to me. And this is all in my mind. I had gotten baptized in December and there was a, a girl in the church who had heard my testimony and, and uh, she had approached me right around February and she's like, hey, I think God wants me to give you money. Now, no one knew how much money, but I'm like, no, you don't. No, you don't. Go, go pray. I completely blew her off because I needed to know that this money was going to come from God and no human interaction. But she kind of lingered around. And so I said, okay, we got together at the altar. and We said, God, this girl thinks you want her to give me money. If you want her to give me money, then I need to see this particular Bible verse sent to my phone in the morning. I need to see these specific license plates sometime throughout the day. I need to hear the verse to this song at this time somewhere. I put God in this box because again, I want to know human involvement. I needed to know this money was from God. And so God, if this money's from you, you got to do these things. If I know you do these things, then I can proceed. So that was the, 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 the box I put in. That was the fleece we threw out. And I woke up the next morning and nothing happened. No Bible verse, no song lyrics, no, no license plate. And I'm a wreck. God's not going to provide. I, I, didn't, I didn't hear from him. This is just something that I wanted. It was not real. And then maybe I didn't get saved and God's not real. And It's over. I'm going to prison. And it was right at that time that this one of my friends had come into an office. Now, he was on vacation. He was home an entire week but he had just so happened to come in at that time. And he said, John, God doesn't have to tell you anything. If he wants to bless you, he's going to bless you. You just have to humble yourself and accept it. And I was like, wow, that's right. Because that's most of us, right? We want to see before we believe. And God says, believe, and then you'll see. So I got back together with this girl from church. I said, okay, God, she thinks you want to give uh, me money through her. Whatever she wants to give, I'll accept it. And I said, left, amen. She still didn't know the amount. The very next morning, we woke up. Everything that we asked God to do, that box he did. Bible verse we asked him to send. Sent license plates, license plates. Song lyrics at a time. God, I need to hear. Throw a 20 in the plate, but I never give till it hurts. At 3.33 p.m. And I heard it. Throw a 20 in the plate, but I never give till it hurts at 3.33 I got the screenshots from the text messages. Text her, oh my God, this is from God. And a week later, Sunday service, I'm sitting in the front row with Candace, my wife, who wasn't my wife at the time, but she, she is now, obviously. <laughs> so let me just say something about my wife. Part Part of the testimony I leave out a lot is her involvement and role in my life. She stuck with me through all of this. And even, you know, as new believers, we're somewhat 
it was a hard promise to stand on, you know. And she said, you know, regardless of what happens, I'm going to be here. You know, you go away, I'll be with you. I said, God, I used her to lean on, you know. And I love her very much. Hi. Are you crying? Okay, good. Where were we? That Sunday, I'm sitting in the front row with my wife, and this girl hands a check for $17,000, uh, a cashier's check to my lawyer. And um, the girl had said to me, she's like, you know what? I've been praying and asking God to be involved in something big. And this is what he did. And I also had been praying God and asking him to test me to see who I love more, him or money. So you need to understand that just as much as God's answering your prayers, he's answering mine as well. 17 grand, boom. We're sitting in the front row and it's like, I was scared. Okay, now listen. Because up until that point, it was like, I knew I had been communicating with God. I knew he'd done a work in my life. Uh, up until then, it was like cool Bible verses that came at just the right time. Someone would say something at just the right time. You know, I start to see things like, oh my God, God spoke. But at that moment, God showed up. And we were holding a check for 17 grand. And we went out to eat afterwards. And it was just like, we couldn't talk. We couldn't move. We were like, do you understand? This is... There was fear. What are we communicating with? Right? Who, who, who's doing this? I go into my lawyer's office and I was like, hey, you know, I told you God had said he wants us to go to trial. And I know you said you needed 17 grand. And I told you I was going to pray for it because I didn't have it. Well, there you go. There you go. But that wasn't the end, right? Things continue to linger and lagger. And so October 2014, my lawyer says, now my two partners are in prison at this point, serving 12 and 15 years. They took plea deals. And my lawyer comes and he says, they're offering you six years. You should take it. You're facing 20 plus. If you go to trial, the judge already said, if they find you guilty on anything, you're going to get hammered. They're going to make an example out of you. 20 minimum. Get found guilty, you're looking at 30. They're, they're going to hammer you. You should take this deal. I'm like, I should. We had a family meeting, an intervention really. My family had a, they tried several interventions on me, really, because, listen, Catholic, hey, God doesn't speak to you. God doesn't have an in, 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 intimate relationship with you. He's not personal. He's there, but he's, he's not going to talk to you. He doesn't lead you. So I'm telling them, God spoke to me. I got saved. Things are different. He provided. This is how he did it. And they're like, listen, on paper, this family meeting, I'm telling them, and they're like, we think you should take the deal. We think you should take the deal. And I'm like, I think I should take the deal. I think I, I know what I did. I know evidence. I know witnesses. I know what it says on paper. I know what lawyers said. I know what judges says. I know what the internet says. I know what I say. I should take the deal. You're right. I'm stupid for not. I should take this deal. I should. But there's this thing within me, as small as it is, that says, keep going. That says, keep going. And I got to the point of saying, you know what? God had done this and this and this. He's going to continue. He has to continue according to who he is. He has to deliver me. There, this can't go any other way. Even though everything in front of my face says it's only going to go this way. We walk by faith not by sight. 
And I'd gotten to the point of saying, you know what, I would rather serve 30 years in prison knowing I followed God than take a five-year deal and always wonder for the rest of my life what would have happened had I continued to follow him. I had a handful of people maybe who stood with me. I was pretty much in this thing alone, standing on this promise of God. This is an impossible situation. I should not be here. I'm well aware of that. But God, but, but God, my, 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 my lawyer tells me October 2014th, hardest month of my life, spiritual warfare, heavy. Lawyer says, how do you know that this isn't God having mercy on you? How do you know God didn't give you this promise and then provide these funds to get you to this point, to get this deal? This is mercy. This is mercy. That was Satan. That was Satan. But in my mind, I'm like, yeah. Yeah, that might make sense. God, I, God, I need to hear from you. God, you, I need to hear from you. I need to hear from you. And something moved within me in that moment. It was like, it was after midnight. Something moved within me that said, check your Bible verse. Every morning I get a Bible verse sent to my phone. I pull it out. It's Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man lays a snare, but those who trust in the Lord are safe. And I'm like, I don't know this. I never heard this. I've watched it countless hours of sermons from numerous preachers. I've never heard this preached. I'm looking up all these translations. I was like, I don't know what this means, but I believe God's trying to speak to me, but I have no idea, and I go to sleep. And I'm awoken out of a dead sleep with this. The fear of man lays a snare, but those who trust in the Lord say, I pop up out of my sleep, and I'm like, what is that? It wasn't audible, but it was, it was so clear and loud that it woke me up out of my sleep. And again, I'm like, man, I think God's trying to speak to me. I think God's trying to speak to me. Now, that night, I go to Bible study. It was a Thursday night Bible study. A week prior, Holy Spirit moved within me and says, you need to be present on this week because the speaker's going to have something for you. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I'm scared. I'm in my feelings. Which, let me just tell you this. Those times, those seasons, those moments in your life when you don't want to do the things of God are the times when you need to do the things of God. No, I don't want to pray. I don't want to read. I don't want to love. I don't want to forgive. I don't want to give. That is opposition coming up against you to keep you from doing the things of God. That's when you need to push through and do the things of God. So I pushed through and I went to this Bible study. And I'm sitting there and I'm listening to the speaker. And I'm like, I don't got nothing. I don't know what, you know, cool speaker. You know, I don't, he's not telling me anything. And in his message, he goes, Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man lays a snare, but those who trust in the Lord are safe. I immediately, uncontrollably start weeping. I get up and I leave because God spoke. Three times in the same day, I heard the same thing, which translates to the fear of man lays a snare. Your fear of prison is, is a trap. This deal is a trap. Don't take this deal. Stay with me and you'll be safe. Keep going on the path that I've laid out. That's what God spoke to me. God, what do you want me to do? Take this deal? No, keep going. Now, I'm going to teach you a little bit next year on how God speaks, but this repetition, right? God speaks through his word, through people you heard, through music, through movies, through books. Three times in the same day I heard this, which was God saying, stay on the path. Stay on the path. So God saved me. God promised me deliverance. God provided. God guided. Now we had started pre-trial motions, which is when the state argues what should be allowed in trial and then we say it shouldn't be allowed in trial. Now we started that and the judge ruled favorably on my behalf so much so that the state said, Judge, based on your rulings, you restrict us from trying our case. We're going to appeal your decision to the appellate court. Now that's an 11th month process, so we went to the appellate court. The appellate court agreed with the circuit court judge. The state then appealed that decision to the Illinois Supreme Court, which is another 11th month trial. So my name was in the Illinois Supreme Court, but the Illinois Supreme Court again decided that the judge in the original, the circuit court judge was right. State's attorney at some point was pregnant. So that's, 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 I'm trying to explain to you why it took five years, five year long limbo 
five-year-long learning in Holy Spirit University is where I was. Because in this five-year period is when I began preaching and teaching. Um, it was February or March 2014, right after I got saved. No, 2013. It's still cold out. I'm in Candace's car. We're going to my parents' house on, on 2, 290, 294. And I just feel this feeling of saying, hey, I, I can't explain it. You're called. There's more to your life than just I'm saving you and delivering you. You, you, you have a gift. Uh, I, I'm gifting you with, with communication and teaching and preaching. You're going you're to be a pastor. I'm, I'm just called. I didn't know what it was because I'm still saved. But in this five-year period of limbo and learning and Holy Spirit University, God calls. And I begin uh, preaching. Um, my, my old pastor was my best friend and his father-in-law pastored a church and he had heard about me from my friend so he calls me December 20th 2014 was the first time I preached a sermon I had no idea what I was doing sometimes I still don't really know what I'm doing but you guys I tricked I got you guys fooled no just kidding <laughs> I had no idea how to prepare a sermon or how to preach but here I am you know standing there and the opportunities continue to come I continue to preach at, at different churches and then my pastors like hey we have a lot of teenagers coming I want you to be youth pastor and so now I'm youth pastoring these kids and I start pastoring at camps I'm leading these camps of hundreds of kids all while in this five-year trial and this whole time I'm telling people God's gonna deliver me God's gonna deliver me God's gonna deliver me and people are like I don't think so. I don't think so. And, and I'm like, yeah, kind of, me neither sometimes. Me neither sometimes. But, but that's what he said. And so it's not like God spoke this promise and I kept it until afterwards. God spoke this promise and I'm telling people during. Now, I say that to say who in their right mind could do that unless God was working through them? Who in their right mind could go and preach and teach and have peace and joy and tell people about Christ in the midst of that, in the midst of facing 20 plus years, unless God was at work in their life? And so while you may stand and look at me and say, wow, great faith. No, the faith I have is a gift from God. Stand and look at me, but look right through me. Look right through me at the work of God. Look at what only the Holy Spirit can do in the life of someone. Don't look at me and be amazed by me. Look at God and be amazed by God. Because only God can do this. Only God can do something like that. So God called me. February 2018. February 11th at 2.11 p.m. I remember to the minute. Because I had my phone on silent all day. I'm starting trial on the 13th. It's Sunday. February 11th is a Sunday. Trial's on Tuesday. My phone's on silent. I don't want to talk to no one. I definitely don't want to talk to my lawyer. I hate seeing his name come up on my phone. But I just so happened to pick up my phone and whose name is on there. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I don't look at this phone all day. The one time I pick up the phone, your name's there. Hello. You say, you go in the other room. Hello. Yeah, I was talking with so-and-so and they said this and... And then I said this, and can you believe that this happened? And then, you know, this person said this, and we arranged for that, and I don't know. And I'm like, man, does this happen with everyone? Well, you know, this, that, and the other, and this person said this. Well, here's what's going on. The state's going to drop all charges against you. The state's dropping all charges against you after five years. Now, I would love to tell you I jumped for joy. I'd love to tell you I fell down on my knees and cried and praised God, but I didn't. I knew it all along. God, God told me back in October 2013. So there wasn't this moment of, oh, it was just like, yeah. I am God. There are none other. I am God. There was no one like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done saying my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all of my purpose. Of course this happened. What God said happened happens. It will always happen. 
What God says will always happen. Of course this has happened. I'm not surprised by this. We go into my lawyer's office two days later, <laughs> and he goes, can you believe this? Don't answer that. <laughs> yeah, I do. I've been telling everyone for the last five years God was going to do this. God was going to do the impossible. I want you to... God is real. After that, God began to restore me. I got married April 28th, 2018. Then we had our firstborn, March 2020. We bought our home November 2020. Had our second born, 2022, November. Let me tell you how I got here. I go to this meeting in February 2020, pre-COVID, okay? Now, I'm camp pastor. I've been camp, summer camp pastor for four years, okay? Two different camps, children's and teens, hundreds of kids. And I go to this meeting about camp that's happening in summer, in February, and I'm going to tell them I can't be camp pastor, at least for this year. My wife's going to give birth in March, and I want to be home in the summer to be with her. I can't be camp pastor this year, but I got a guy who I want to step in for me, okay? Now, at this meeting, there's this little old lady who I've never seen before. And she's like, hey, I'm so-and-so, don't even know her name, from Families of Faith in Shanahan. Now, Shanahan, I'm like, dang, that's far down south. You're probably, are you, how'd you get here? You fly? Like, what are you, how are you, what are you doing in this camp? You're far. I had no idea where Shanahan, I couldn't even say it uh, for the first couple of months. I said Shanahan, because I'm from the south side, and we do that. So... August 2020. Okay, that meeting happened. Summer camp happened. August 2020. I'm sitting in my old church pew because it's built in the 1800s, so it's old. And I'm sitting there, and I just get this. I have no teenagers, so I'm like, you know what? I, I, I there's no one around. All my teenagers had aged out, and I got this new group of children that are about to come up, but I haven't poured into them yet. So I'm sitting there, and as God speaks to me, he's like, your, your time's up here. You're done. I knew I was done. I was like, I'm done. What am I going to do now? In walks the deacon with a letter that's written to me. Now, I never get letters, and it's from families of faith. And I'm like, where is this at, you know? And how do you know about me? I'm from a church in the 1800s. Anytime it rained, the basement flooded. Not anytime it rained hard. Anytime it rained the basement flooded, and that's where, how do you know about me? Who are you writing? So, open this up. Hey, we're doing some great things out here, and we would love to know if you want to come out and join us. You know, uh, youth pastor, Bible teacher, I don't know exactly what the letter said. Randy Bland, phone number. And I'm, I'm like, what is, who, how, I'm not, I didn't submit no applications. I'm not out there, like, trying to, get hired any I don't even know what this is so I the first conversation I ever had with Pastor Randy was like hello hey I just I just I don't know <laughs> I just wanted to talk to the guy that wrote me the letter he had no idea about the letter he had no idea about the letter I just want to talk to the guy that wrote the letter and just say hey this is me is this you yeah okay so he's like why don't you come out for a Sunday service no why don't you come out and meet me sometime during the week? We set up a meeting, and I come here, and I meet him right here in the lobby. Well, I pull in, and I'm like, what is this? This is a mega church, you know? I'm from a church in the 1800s, stained glass, pews, flooded basement. I pull onto this property, and I'm like, this is a joke. <laughs> this is a setup. Feds are coming back to get me. This is all... <laughs> This is on my mind. I got post post traumatic. Okay, so I pull out. I'm like, this is set up. This is set up. This is a mega church, and I meet with him, and we go in his office, and Joe and Rhonda and Karen are in there, and and I'm like, is this an interview? Like, are you guys? There? What are we doing? You know, you, we're not just meeting. And then he he takes me on a tour, and he walks on. He's like, this is where your office would be. And I'm like, what? I, my office. 
Oh, you're me. He takes me through the whole school, the gyms. Yeah, look at the baseball fields out there. And then we come back, and he's like, why don't you come out for Sunday service? I want you to see what it's like. So I'm like, okay. And I go home, and my wife's like, how'd it go? I was like, I have no idea. I don't know what I just walked into. I think they like me. Like, I think... I think he wants to hire me. I have no idea. We were supposed to meet. And then they the start, and there's this guy with a beard in there, because Joe was in there, right? So I was like, what am I getting into? You know, what is this? <laughs> what is this? So we come out on Sunday, and we come to a service, and uh, we go to uh, eat lunch afterwards. And finally, I just asked him straight up. I'm like, listen, man, are you trying to hire me? And he's like, yes. Yeah, we're, we're, I'm very interested in you being our youth pastor, Bible teacher, and successor. Okay, so I, we knew about this for four years. This was always a plan. That's how, that's how wise Pastor Randy is. This guy is in the future, man. This guy is in the future. And so I said, okay, let me pray about it. Now, you ever have one of those prayers where you can't pray because God's just like, Really? You're asking, you can't see, you haven't connected. The, that was that prayer. I go home and I'm like, God, all right, I, I got it. I got it, you know? And I call Pastor Randy and I'm like, hey, you know, I can't pray about this. I believe this is from God. And he said, so do I. I just wanted to hear you say it. And all the while I'm meeting and talking with Pastor Randy, he's mentioning this name, Betty. Yeah. Betty this and Betty that. And I'm like, who's Betty? I keep hearing about Betty, Betty, Betty. Finally, I meet Betty and I'm like, you're the lady from the meeting. You're the lady from the meeting in February who I never met before. And she was apparently impressed by by me having a successor for my camp pastor that she came back and told Pastor Randy, hey, I met a guy, and I think he'd be great here. And she sent the letter. Now, I want you to see God's providence in all this, okay? Nothing random, nothing by chance, nothing by coincidence, all orchestrated. I've been camp pastor for four years. The one meeting I go to, the one lady that comes from here that's connected with him. That now, So I'm here. God brought me here. God brought me here. Now, I want to invite our worship team up at this point because you might be asking yourself, what does this have to do with you? All right, I've, I've been praying and asking God for a word. In my outline here, everything is past tense. Okay, God saved me. God promised me. God provided me for me. God guided me. God called me. God delivered me. God installed me. God, what word do I say next? And this is what God says next. God continues. That's present tense. God continues. What do I need you to hear in all this? God continues to save continues to promise, continues to provide, continues to guide, continues to deliver, continues to call, continues to restore, continues to install, continues to forgive, continues to move and build and create and reveal and glorify Himself. God's going to continue this journey of faith. Now, if I'm you, and I'm sitting here, and I hear that story last week, of how we're in a building that we shouldn't be in. And now you're hearing a story from a guy who shouldn't be here. And to know that God and His divine providence oversees everything and has crossed our paths for such a time as this, I'm starting to think, what am I doing here? What does God want to do in your life? Because this journey of faith continues. It's not Pastor Randy's journey of faith or Pastor John's journey of faith. This is God's doing. This is God's moving. And you are part of this. You are part of this. Do you understand that? If I'm you, my mind... Hold on a second. This guy shouldn't be here. This building shouldn't be here. And yet here we both are. And you're here? 
What's God want to do in your life? What's God want to do in your life? I'll tell you what God wants to do in your life. He wants you to know Him. He wants you to know Him in a real, personal, intimate way, the same way that I've come to know Him, that Pastor Randy has come to He wants you to know Him. Not know about Him, not know of Him, know Him personally. This is the word that God's given me. This is where we're going in the future. Taste and see that the Lord is good. God wants you to taste and see that the Lord is good. It's only until you taste and see that the Lord is good that any of these messages preached from the pulpit will be applied to your life. Pastor Randy spent the last year of his ministry in a series called Building Families of Faith. Well, we're going to begin next year building faith and families. Building faith and families. God wants you to know Him. If you're here today and you don't know Him, let me tell you, He knows you and He loves you. And you may think you're here by ways of an invite. You may think you randomly, coincidentally, just so happen to be sitting in these seats, but I can tell you 100% God has orchestrated your life to be here, right here, right now to hear this. I know you, and I love you, and I created you to be in a relationship with me. But your sin has eternally separated you from me, and I know this. There's nothing you can do to work, earn, or pay your way back to me. That's why I sent my son Jesus Christ to live and die, take your punishment upon himself. He suffered, he died, he was buried, and he rose on the third day. Because he did that, I can now offer you that relationship that you want. That relationship that you were created to have, that intimate, personal love relationship. The relationship that you hear Pastor Randy talk about, that you hear me talk about. These movements of God, experiencing God is offered to you. All you have to do is say, God, I want it. God, I want it. Wholeheartedly say, God, I, I don't understand everything. I don't know everything that that guy said, but here's what I do know. There's something missing. There's something missing and I don't like it. And I know it's you. I need you. God, I need you. I need you. If you wholeheartedly repent, if you wholeheartedly seek God, you will find him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Next year, 2024, we're going to go on a journey together and we're going to be teaching you things and we're going to have events and programs and studies and conferences that is going to lead you into this God experience. It's going to lead you into tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. The harvest is plenty, but the labors are few. And in order to really be a harvester, you got to know the harvester. And so that's where we're going to go. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Let's start right now. Let's start right now. We're going to close in a song. Here's what I want you to do. I don't just want you to sing it. I want you to mean it. I want you to mean it. I want you to make the words that we're about to sing your own words. You want to grow? Who here wants to grow? Personally, spiritually, relationally, corporately? You want to grow? Here's an opportunity right now to grow. If you've never sang, sing. If you sing, sing louder. If you never raise your hands, raise your hands. Call out to God with all your heart and ask Him to set a fire in your soul that you can't contain, that you can't control. You want more of God? You can have as much of God as you want. Ask Him for it. Take that step of faith. Taste and see that the Lord is good. I ask you now to rise. Make this your prayer.